This pre-meeting briefing of the Carrollton Farmers Branch ISD Board of Trustees to order at 6 p.m. on January 17, 2007. 2019, whatever. The purpose of this pre-meeting briefing is to conduct a briefing session with administrative staff regarding the posted agenda for the regular board meeting scheduled for 7 p.m. today. For the record, all board members are present and we do constitute a quorum. Item number two is briefing session with administrative staff regarding the posted agenda. Board members, do you have any reg questions regarding the consent agenda items? Okay, board members. Happy New Year. <laughs> Reports by administration. It looks like we're on item three. Yeah, so we want to walk through. Um, basically, you're going to hear more about the taper. And so we want to walk through the domains with you today. And at this time, so Dr. Warnock, Dr. Warnock's going to walk through domain three. There's three domains, but she wants to give a brief presentation to, to review the board on what it entails and how we're gonna move forward in the future before you get the report that's coming soon. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Uh, President Klein, members of the board, uh, tonight and then for the next two months, we're gonna review each month in the pre-meeting a part of the uh, accountability system. So tonight we're gonna start with the last domain, which is domain three. Then at the March board meeting, um, we'll have a report on our taper from 2018. We really wanna be showing you how we're using this information to uh, plan and move forward for this year and, and into 2020. Um, so I'm hoping that the slides pop up there. Wiggle the connection. Yeah, it was, it was on there, then it went out. It is. Okay, let's see. Okay, I'm going to just move over there. Well, I don't know. Mm -mm. I'll just move over there. Okay. So, um, so tonight and then for each of the next two board meetings prior to the March meeting, we'll be explaining a different part of the accountability system. This is our first year with this accountability system, um, uh, 2018 was, and then 2019, this will be our second year. The commissioner has told us that for five years, this is going to stay stable, which is really exciting because since 2012, every year we've had a change in our accountability system and it's been a moving target. So um, we, we feel really good about that. The other piece that we feel good about as the education team is that uh, we've had the rules in advance for this system. So previously we would be testing and then get the rules and how things are gonna proceed for the accountability often uh, right before, right after students were testing. So it feels more fair to us that we know in advance. The other part that we think is really fair is that there are multiple pathways to success in this accountability system and you know knowing how it works we we can better uh, prepare our students and think both strategically and uh, with the goal of every child in mind um, the way it works there's three different domains and the first two domains are called student achievement and school progress and we're going to talk more about those later those comprise 70 percent of cfb score and of the campus scores and then the third domain, closing the gaps, is 30% of the, the score. 
with domain one and two, it's considered a best of system. So whichever one the campus does better in one or two, that's going to count 70%. But for closing the gaps, that 30%, there's no best of. It's only that uh, 30%. So we'll look at that. You'll see in numbers that there are scaled scores. So there might be a, um, a 60 in domain one translates into an A. It scales up to a 90. So, and that's true in every one of the domains, there's scaled scores. So just wanted to call your attention to that, like why is an 82 an A and a 47 is a B? It's just the way that the state is scaling them. So when we look into domain three, this is our closing the gaps. And the, this is where the state disaggregates data and looks at 14 different student groups and how they're performing. Each group only counts if there are 25 or more tests. So if we're looking at our Pacific Islanders for CFB does not count as a student group because there are fewer than 25 students that are Pacific Islander. Um, but all of our race and ethnicity categories count there. Special education and students who are former special ed, so that's being uh, looked at how those students are performing. Then our continuously enrolled and non-continuously enrolled students. Continuously enrolled are those students who've been with us at least four years. They've been with us four Octobers, so they count in that group. And then our English learners, also included in English learners, are four years of tracked students once they exit the English learner uh, program, and then our economically disadvantaged students. So those groups um, are, are tracked for every campus and for the district. So in the closing the gaps, so that's 30% of our total score, and then that 30% is broken into chunks. So for elementary and middle, and we look at four different components that make up that 30%. The first is academic achievement. And so that's 30% of this domain. And that is our kids who are meeting grade level standard. So we have you know, several different levels. Kids can approach grade level performance or meet grade level performance or master grade level performance. So this academic achievement is for our students who are meeting grade level targets in reading and math only. So 15% is the reading, 15% is the math. And each of those subgroups, those 14, get weighted into that, that 30%. Okay. So it's really kind of a simple formula. If you had 10 of those targets that counted for your school because that's what's included based on your 25 tests, then you'd have 20 targets. If you hit the target, 20 of the 20 groups, you have 100 in that, you get 30% weight. You know, if you only hit 50 of the targets, 50%, you'd get 15 points there. So that's how that's calculated. Uh, the next is academic growth status. Part of our accountability system is really looking at what's the achievement, kids meeting grade level standard, but the more important piece is how are kids growing? Are they making progress from year to year with the idea that I might start off uh, low, lower than another student, but if I keep making gains over time, eventually I'll hit that achievement piece. So that's 50% of this domain is did a certain percentage of every one of those 14 subgroups hit their growth target. Next is the English language proficiency, and that's rated through TELPASS, which is our assessment of reading, writing, speaking, and listening. That's a 10% weight here. It's one indicator, and it's for our English language learners. Every school in CFB met the target last year for English language proficiency. And then the last one for elementary and middle is student achievement star component. And that is looking at the meets grade level expectations for all tests. So not just reading and math, but also for science and writing uh, and social studies at middle school. So those components there, um, that, that's all star based for elementary and middle. At the high school, it's a little bit different. The academic achievement piece uh, is the same and um, the graduation rate is the same 
At the high school, it's about growth. That 50% is um, that academic achievement piece. The graduation rate is the federal graduation rate, and it has to be 90% uh, for every subgroup or higher. And then our English language proficiency. And then the 30% is our college career military readiness. And so we have nine different ways that students can achieve college career military readiness. They can pass a CTE certificate or licensure on an approved list that the state puts out. They can earn an associate's degree. They can enlist in the military. Uh, they can take nine dual credit hours in any content or three dual credit hours in reading or math. Uh, they can be IEP workforce ready if they're a student being served um, through special education that qualifies for that. They can also meet what we call the TSI, it's the college entrance uh, cut for mathematics and reading using the SAT, ACT, or uh, the ACCUPLACER is the version that we use in partnership with the Dallas County Community Colleges. Or they can score three on AP exams or four on an IB exam and also meet the college readiness marker. So, we, we have to have systems to track all of that so that we code it appropriately for, for students. Um, and that is what counts for both the high school and the district. So, you know, 30% of the district's accountability is held at the high school in that CCMR factor. So that's just something important for us to look at. Another thing that's interesting in the system, I know this is small, and I'll be happy to send you all these slides so that, that you have a copy of those for your reference in the future. The targets that are set for each of those 14 groups are different. So um, if you look and see all students meeting grade level expectation, 44% have to meet in English and reading and 46% in mathematics. If you look at our uh, you know, Hispanic students, it's 37% meeting in English and reading, 40% mathematics. If you look at our Asian students, it's 74% meeting grade level expectation in reading and 82% in math. So they're differentiated targets based on the current state of um, performance of each of those groups across the state of Texas with some reach goals. We met all of our targets except for Asian. That was the, the place where we were, uh, where we missed, so as a district. So that's something that we're, we're working on. Um, then you can see the same differentiated growth targets. Um, and then also the graduation rate is constant at 90% across. Um, and then the college career military performance rates differ also by each of those um, groups. So how are we in CFB using this information to help prepare students? I, um, I put a copy of the STAR data planning form um, to the right of your notebook up there so you can see that. Um, we have what is called a snapshot date in October. It's the last Friday of October, and that's where the state of Texas takes this kind of snapshot of who's sitting in the schools in Texas. And that's what we use for what's called the accountability subset. So if a student is at Barbara Bush Middle School on that Friday in October and they leave, they transfer in January and they go to Polk Middle School, then that student counts on the district's <coughs> accountability but on neither Polk nor Bush because they were in one place one day and they weren't there on the testing date. If the child is here in CFB in October and they leave and go to Dallas ISD, that child counts for neither the districts, neither district. So um, it's important for us to know who our students are on snapshot date. And those are the numbers that we've used as we've worked to coach principals uh, in understanding the system and information. So we've walked through um, this packet. You see the, we'll look at the other pages later, um, but the domain three is the last domain. So we have sat down in a data meeting one-on-one -on -one with each principal, and I just I brought this, I guess, for visual effect, but this is the, the data set for our elementary schools. So going through all of this with them to workshop out 
what it's going to look like. And I sat side by side with them so you can see just like scribbledy, scrabbled notes to set targets and goals and then you know to think through what counts for them, what doesn't to help them construct the right groups to be thinking about how we move the work forward. So um, we are working to fill this out and then identifying what our next steps and you can see we set um, next steps for each of the principles up at the top like with this set of data this is what you're to be uh, moving forward here are some resources to help you our assessment accountability team has been amazing really out on campuses uh, leading PD for teachers helping them to understand the data and, and helping principals with that too um, and you see this is the high school piece with CCMR it's a little bit different so this is kind of our workshop for for them to think through their data this is an example of one of the data reports that our accountability team has put together that every principal has access to um, that's really helpful to us. So you can see this is at Long Middle School. So this is the children's fifth grade results from last year. Um, there's no names or identifying information included here. But um, I can pull this for every grade level, every test, every campus, and all of our, our team has access to this. So they can see and they can sort by column. They can use this information to manipulate any way they need to to help them uh, understand where students are. So this you know, gives us a picture if the child is in special education services, economically disadvantaged, their English proficiency status, uh, ethnicity, which is important as we're looking at the domain three, and then just what their percent score was. Are they on track? Did they make progress? Are they gifted and talented? Um, and then that helps us look at, at different pieces of the puzzle and how we're uh, making progress. For the high schools, it's a little bit different picture. At the middle schools and elementary, it's just by grade level. So I know all my third graders, all of my fourth graders. At high school, when we're looking at you know, who's in the accountability subsets and how do we figure that, we have to look at a couple of different places. So we go in and look at our course enrollment. So this is uh, Turner. I pulled uh, Turner's pieces here. Uh, so this is all of the courses that may be tested in one of our end of course exams. And then we see uh, our retesters are also included in the testing count. So you know, if we look at, there's 780 English tests at RL Turner for English one, it includes our first time testers and also those retesting students are included in their accountability um, until, uh, until they exit or pass. Um, this is the breakdown of our snapshot data and every campus has a report that looks like this um, for their use in a shared data file. So as we have these coaching conversations and we're working, um, we're providing and uploading that for them. This is another um, report that uh, Kathy Webb and uh, Melanie Williams, our counseling uh, team, have been working on and we're uploading this for every one of our high school campuses and we're really um, I think I'm proud of this we've been working with some other districts in the region to try to come up with a common solution and so we're we're moving forward with this um, but where we can track students grade level their cohort any kind of special programming identification and then you can see that column L it's it's small um, but that's their CCMR. So that tells us if they've passed the AP test, if they've um, gotten a certificate or licensure, if they've met their TSI, how they met it with SAT or ACT. Um, we're also preparing to give the AccuPlacer to a, a senior class this next week. If they're in a CTE program, um, and then what they still need. And then there's a space for our counselors and administrators and a shared uh, drive to be able to go in and make notes about where students are in progress. So this will be how we're tracking the CCMR factors. Um, there's also some new requirements about peace officer training, uh, CPR instruction, and those are also being tracked here so that we verify that all of our students have those. And then finally, we have collapsed all of this data for all of our schools and domains one, two, and three into a shared tracker with 2017, 18, and then a place to set 19 targets. So all of the principals um, sat and 
and gave us the information about where they wanted to be, where they wanted to go, um, and then we figured out what's it going to take to get where you want to be um, and where we want to be as a district, and um, and what can we do to help you get there. Today at our principals meeting, then we had a shared uh, share aloud of people sharing the strategies about what's next. So principals are taking that. They've already gone back to campuses. They're working with their teachers to put students in tutorial groups to you know, extend uh, Friday night schools, Saturday morning schools, tutoring opportunities, revamping maybe what they need. Um, looking at the standards and grouping students that way. So um, lots of great ideas that our principals are taking and putting back into place at their campuses. Um, and then this is an example of our, the CCMR factors for the high schools. So um, you can see the graduation rate target, you know, where we were in 17 and 18, and then where we're shooting for 19, but just so that the board is aware that graduation rate and the CCMR run a year in arrears. So um, what we're working on right now will be reflected in the 2020 accountability for graduation rate in the college career military readiness piece. So that's a little bit about domain three. And I know it's a lot of information. Um, when the state says, it's simple, it's an A or a B, it, it's, it's less simple than just an A or a B. So any questions that I can help answer for you or I wonders that you have? Impressive amount of data. I don't know how y'all get through it. But, um, so on um, those focus, on the, the sheet that had the four focus areas on top, and then y'all are using the per kid, the actual by kid data to focus in those areas, right, on the what needs to be improved? Right. Okay. So then if there's kids in the group of kids that are green across the board, but, um, you know, maybe not in the, the highest category and what's the focus for them you know are they getting how do they not get lost yeah so that's a great question and that's something that we talked about today in the old accountability system the goal was just to get kids across the line so you really focused on your um, kids that weren't passing and how you were getting get them to pass right. in this system every child has to make growth okay. so in that um, in the domain two and then even in that domain three looking at the growth indicators that means if I have a kid who is at masters I have to keep them at masters and keep pushing them so one of the strategies if I have a kid who is at the meets level I have to push them to get to masters so it's every single child some of the things that we're doing um, are focusing on um, like Friday Night Lights kind of programs where um, kids are identified for um, uh, that kind of just extra push to move them to the next level. And then we've also seen a lot of success in having data talks with students and that's happening um, all over the district where I'm sitting down with a child who's at that um, high in performing but could still move further and saying hey let's look at your data this is what you're struggling with so when we um, are te doing that teach piece on inferences or conclusions or multi-step problem solving this is what your struggle is and so I want you to, to be tuned into that um, early college adopted that strategy and saw a huge increase in their students going from meets to masters just from having data talks with students so that's something that we're replicating Mm -hmm. um, kudos to all the good work and please share with all of the assessments group our appreciation I have a really elementary question it's one of those that I'm almost embarrassed to ask but uh, when we look at the English language groupings does that include all of our segments like ESL, ELL, mm -hmm. LEP? So they're yes. all, okay, they're yeah. all stuck there. Yeah, that okay. is not an elementary question. That is <laughs> a tough question because we have all different kind of categorization right. for our language learners. Right. But that's comprehensive and includes students who have exited, but we want to continue monitoring their progress for four years. They're also included in that group. So I'm, I'm kind of impressed that the TEA seems to be attempting to account for mobility and for differentiated targets. Do you feel like these targets are reasonable um, in terms of the differentiated ones by ethnicity? 
Um, I, do I think that they're reasonable? Yes. Do I think that they're acceptable? Not in the long run. So I, I, I do think that the goal is that we, um, we catch these targets and then they're going to move up and up until the gaps are really closed is what the goal is. Um, but I, I appreciate the state setting what I would say are smart goals. You know, they're realistic, attainable, um, and so we're going to keep, keep working at them. Do the goals vary by district? No, they don't. Uh, the targets are set for the whole state. So um, the pieces that vary by district, and we're going to look at this um, really next time, is our uh, the accounting for relative poverty. So when we talk about domain two, we're going to dig into that a little bit. And that's how districts are reflected. And we're going to show you how our comparison group shakes out. On the college career and military readiness, is that scaled, you know, is, or is it a flat measurement, you know, of the number of blocks that were checked? Yeah, it is scaled. So right now the target for all students to be at an A is 60%. So we're looking at 60% at of the students have um, a college career military readiness indicator. The one piece that right now you can get a half a point for is a coherent sequence in a career and technology class. Next year, that's going away. This is the only year that that's going to be allowable. Beginning next year, students will have to have an industry certificate or licensure to get the CTE check, which I want to just celebrate our CTE. Over the past two years, our career certificate attainment has gone from 36% to 72%. So, I mean, that's been a real focus and will continue to be. Um, we're going to be sharing with you a draft plan to roll out for some additional certificates and licensures. Do you anticipate that 60% will raise over time? I anticipate Just over like time, but Commissioner Morath has promised us, so that's a promise, uh, unless there's legislative action that these targets are going to stay consistent for five years because that's been really the feedback from districts like you keep changing the system you change the target it's always moving <laughs> like just stop and let us understand it let us try to move this direction it is fair it is a reasonable system but let us operate under it consistently and see if we make some traction instead of trying to hit moving targets a different comparison but from my professional life is air quality and the EPA did the same thing. They set, set air quality standards that were a lot different than, and then every couple of years they'd raise them. So anytime you met them, the bar would go higher. Right. And you were always out of conformity, but, and if you've noticed that the air in Dallas has gotten a lot better than it was, say, 10, 15 yeah. years ago. Absolutely. Let us have this for five years and then let's, you know, take the next step. So, any other questions? Before I turn it over, I want to introduce two new faces to, um, to our group that just to connect the board with them. Um, Karen Spaulding is our new elementary math director. So um, welcome, Karen. She joined us this summer. She's coming um, with a wealth of experience as the math director in Denton ISD and is doing an incredible job with our elementary mathematics program. We're all really benefiting from having her on the team. So welcome, Karen. Just wanted you to be able to put a face with a name. And then Carolina Christian is our elementary bilingual director and um, she was an assistant principal with us and um, we felt uh, having someone really focused on early language acquisition and then having uh, someone focused on the ESL secondary language acquisition they're two very different programs so um, we decided to repurpose personnel to to have that and Caroline has been a great addition to the team extremely knowledgeable about English language acquisition so we'll welcome her and you have a face with a name Thank you. That concludes my report, Dr. Chapman. Do you have anything else? No, I'll, and I'll, I'm going to chime in on domain two a little bit and kind of walk through, you know, what was that process that, that superintendents met with MoRath 14 months ago to develop this plan. And as Dr. Warnock has stated, this is, this is truly the, the best equitable plan that we've had going all the way back from looking at teams, toss, tax, and star. And, and you're exactly right. We keep raising that bar. 
but at least we had a commissioner that came in and said, what do you guys want? What is that comparison that, that you want to be, that you want to represent as you educate your kids? And, and the piece that's the most important to me is the fact that you no longer are going to compare yourself to an Allen ISD. We're comparing ourselves to like districts. And so we'll walk through that a little bit. We'll show you a chart, but I, but I appreciate this, and I appreciate the fact that um, when we went to the state, that we, we asked and begged that please stop that that tar that moving target. And he gave us that five years. I'm gonna send you some data just to show you where we were from the beginning of STAR to where we are today. And, and it's remarkable when you put it all on one piece of paper to see how the district could never catch or figure out what is that expectation that we're trying to accomplish. What's the target? For the sake of kids, so. Thank you. Um, Board members, we've reached the end of the agenda for this pre-meeting briefing, and we are adjourned at 6.31 p.m. Thank you. Good evening. I call this regular meeting of the Carrollton Farmers Branch ISD Board of Trustees to order at 7.02 p.m. on January 17, 2019. Board members, district staff members, and members of the audience, you are free to join me in standing as Pastor Rodney Whitfield from Aldersgate United Methodist Church provides a message followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Randy Shackman and the Pledge to the Texas Flag led by Tara Herbacek. Dr. Chapman and all, thank you for having me here. I hope you will join your hearts with mine for this blessing. Most loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day and for all that gather here, for the families and the teachers and the administrators and all the trusted leaders as we gather here tonight. We give you thanks for the way in which you have entrusted us to care for the children that have been placed in our care. We ask your spirit to be upon us. We pray that your spirit will be with us in our deliberation and our discussion tonight. You'll help us to be wise in our decision making. Help us all to be patient and kind with one another, to celebrate with one another, so that if there is disagreement tonight, we all might be heard and we might be with each other and make sure that there is dignity for all. We pray that we might give each other Give to each other this gift of humility and love and care. To all who participate, we ask for your wisdom, for the best decisions that lead with integrity and keep us from short-sightedness and pettiness. Guard us from blind self-interest so that the work might be here tonight, rooted in the desire of us all for the good of your children and all that are around us, that this community we live in might be filled with your love and for your kingdom. It's in God's name that I pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Honor to the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas one state under God. One and indivisible. As a district, we dedicate all our efforts and resources to our goal of high achievement for each student. The board uses this goal to guide all deliberations, decisions, and actions. You will get to see all deliberations, decisions, and actions of the board in open session, with the exception of some items which may be discussed in a closed session as stipulated in the Texas Government Code, Section 551, commonly known as the Open Meetings Act. These items typically deal with personnel matters, consultation with our attorney, and real estate. For the red record, the board members present are all of us. Um, we constitute a quorum and may conduct business on behalf of the district. As required by board policy BBD local, let the minutes reflect that all board members are well on the way to completing or exceeding the required hours of continuing education for the current reporting period ending May 4, 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, before moving on to the next agenda item, I'm going to remind you that the board encourages comments from citizens of the district and from district employees. Anyone wishing to speak either as an individual or as a representative of a group may do so during agenda item number three, audience for guests. Please submit your request to do so on one of the forms provided on the table just outside the north entrance to the boardroom. You may place the completed form in the box provided on the same table or present your completed form to Administrative Assistant Mrs. Kim Castanon over here at this table. So either out there or over here. So when the board addresses agenda item number three, audience for guests, you'll be invited to the podium over here to speak to the board. With that, 
done. We're going to move to agenda item number two, special presentations and recognitions. Um, student performance, Dr. Chapman. Yeah, we're so excited tonight to, to honor an incredible choir at Blaylack. But also, this is also a contribute to you, the Board of Trustees, for all that you do for us each and every day, for your volunteer hours, for the betterment of our kids. So, Mr. Farr. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, members of the board, administration, and guests. It is my honor to be here this evening to introduce to you the Blaylack Chamber Women's Choir under the direction of Head Director Sarah Bells and Assistant Directors Bethany Crawford and Ruth Atkinson. I can tell you for sure that we are all in for a great treat tonight as we honor and recognize the high achievement of the Blaylack Chamber Women and their directors. Towards the end of last school year, Ms. Ms. Bayless submitted a recording of her ensemble to the Texas Music Educators Association, as did many other schools from around the state, to compete for the right to be designated as a state honor choir. It is with great pride that we announce that out of the entire state of Texas, only two middle school choirs were selected to perform at TMEA, and the Blaylack Chamber Women are one of the two, and I feel confident the better of the two. Wow. <laughs> They will perform their entire program on Friday, February 15th in San Antonio, Texas at 10 a.m. in the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center in front of about 2,000 choir directors, as many as, and also family and friends who can attend. For choir, this is like playing in the state championship game, with one exception. We have already won the game. <laughs> if you can attend the convention, let me know, and I'll make sure you get all the details. But if you cannot go to San Antonio, the Blaylack Chamber Women will be giving a pre-TMEA concert on Thursday, January 31st at Valley View Christian Church at 6 p.m. You are welcome and encouraged to attend to support these young ladies. Tonight, we're just going to give you a glimpse of their talent as the choir will perform two of their numbers. The first number we'll perform is Dominus Fobiscum by Jared Navrud, followed by a wonderful arrangement of Go Where I Send Thee by Paul Caldwell and Sean Ivory. So without further delay, please welcome the Blaylack Chamber Women and their directors.
Dr. Chapman, that was pretty incredible. What are we going to do next? <laughs> you won't beat it, I can tell you that. I don't know about you, if that doesn't give you goosebumps, you're dead. We're very blessed. We are. We are. Very talented group of young ladies. And look at Mr. Farr is going to carry that podium thing out of here. <laughs> oh. Thank y'all. So Dr. Chapman, we're on 2B. Yeah, as I was saying before, uh, the governor has stated that the month of January is, is a time for us to celebrate our board of trustees, those individuals that are dedicated for the achievement of our students each and every day. And I'll tell you, we are very blessed in CFB to have a group of seven board members that their number one goal is achievement for all students. And we are grateful for what you do for us each and every day. We're grateful for the dedication that you give. And so today, we're honored to have Mayor Dye from Farmers Branch here, and he would like to say a few words. Dr. Chapman, President Klein, fellow trustees, thanks for having me here today. Uh, you asked what were you going to do next, and I'm sorry that it's so underwhelming. <laughs> I, was, I was looking on the sing? agenda. Huh? Can you sing? No. Okay. <laughs> but I was looking on the agenda, and I saw what was first, and I was like, I do not want to follow that. And then after seeing it, I was absolutely correct. You know, that was not something you want to follow. Absolutely tremendous, and it's just a testament to the talent of the students that we have in this district, and I couldn't be more proud. But I just want to read a proclamation, the City of Farmers Branch School Board Recognition Month. Whereas the mission of the public schools is to meet the diverse educational needs of all children and to empower them to become competent, productive contributors to a democratic society and an ever-changing world. 
And whereas local school board members are committed to the success of our children as they work to ensure high achievement for each child with educational programs tailored to meet the individual needs of the child, and whereas local school board members are responsible for providing leadership that ensures a clear, shared community vision of public education for their schools that sets high educational standards for each student through continuous improvement and requires the effective and efficient operation of the district. And whereas local school board members adopt public policy to give voice to that leadership and employ a superintendent to administer board policy and are responsible for ensuring the structure that provides a solid foundation for our school system. And whereas local school board members are strong advocates for public education and are responsible for communicating the needs of the school district to the public and the public's expectations to the district. And whereas serving on a school board requires an unselfish devotion to time and service and to carry on the mission and business of the school district without compensation. Now, therefore, I, Robert C. Dye, as mayor of the City of Farmers Branch, do hereby declare my appreciation to the members of the Carrollton Farmers Branch Independent School District School Board and proclaim the month of January 2009 as School Board Recognition Month, an official recognition whereof I hereby affix my signature this 17th day of January 2019. And so we are truly honored that you commit your time, your energy, and your passion to not only this community, but this school district, which, as you all know, means a lot to me because I am a fellow alumni, Turner, Field, Stark, and I carry that proudly. And when you asked if I could sing, I did notice during that entire presentation, during the second song, that Trustees Matthews, I think you knew all those words because you were mouthing them the entire time. <laughs> But again, thank you all. Thank you all for having me, and you know, great honor. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Dye. All 38 of the campuses have also provided a gift to the Board of Trustees, and so you've received a basket in appreciation for for all that you've done for us. And so, Miss Brown is going to show. A, Oh, or Ms. Derrick is going to show a basket, and this is just our way of giving to you guys to say thank you, thank you so much for what you do from each and every one of the campuses, and we're grateful for, for your service to our district and our students. Thank you so much. Thank you. You ready? Next, we'll have district announcements. CFBISD is honored to participate in the 25th annual MLK Parade in Carrollton on Saturday, January the 19th, beginning at 10 a.m. behind the Carrollton City Hall. We hope that you will um, all brave the weather. We think it's going to be a great day, though, and come out to cheer on all of our participants. Um, many of our schools are going to be participating. You will hear more about this event in just a minute. Remember that Monday, January 21st, is a district holiday. Campuses and school offices will be closed. Yes, as do well not as forget, okay? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and district offices will be closed also. We want to invite everyone to attend our second annual Stellar Fair on January the 24th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at Ranch View High School. All CFB campuses and signature programs will um, be in one place, and we're going to be sharing the amazing opportunities that are available to all of our students in CFB. We're going to be sharing it through hands-on activities. We're going to be offering to you the vast array of opportunities available for each child in CFB. We will have more than 100 booths that you can visit, um, including animal, live animal demonstrations, robotics, stargazing, planetariums, musical performances, and much more. Um, you can earn prizes by visiting um, lots of the booths, and we'll have more information about that. You should have received a postcard in the mail about it. Come out and find out more information about the great things happening in CFB ISD at our Stellar Fair. Again, that is January the 24th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at Ranchu High School. I would now like to invite Kim Brady, um, the CFB PTA Council Representative, to give us a PTA update. I am so sorry, it's not Kim Brady. <laughs> Standing in for Kim Brady. Good evening, my name is Katherine Carlin and I am the parliamentarian for Carrollton Farmers Branch Council PTA. 
Um, I'm here to, provi to provide a short update of the efforts and activities of both the Council PTA and our local unit PTAs in supporting our mutual goal of high achievement for each student. Membership is a year-long effort for our PTAs. We have several PTAs receiving awards since our last meeting. The Texas PTA Honor Roll Award is 10 of our PTAs have received it for having more members than last year at 100 plus or 250 plus members. The Texas PTA President's List Award, 13 of our PTAs have received it for having more members than they did by last year, December 22nd. A special shout out to McWhorter PTA, and I see Ms. Reed right here, who has increased their membership by over 400% over last year. Way to go. You guys rock. We thank you for that. Our current um, membership total for the district this year so far is around 5,500 members, but our goal is for 6,700 members. So if you haven't already joined, we encourage you to do that. You can do it online at joinpta.org. Last night, the Council PTA hosted our Reflections Award Ceremony at Newman Smith, and thank you to all the family members and community members who were there um, in support of our great artistic students. Springtime is busy time for local PTAs with the creation of nominating committees to help identify um, those willing to lead PTAs at our campuses. So elections will start being held at campuses later in the spring, and Council PTA will provide spring leadership training for those new leaders. We are again partnering with the district for two parent education opportunities this spring. One is next week, January 23rd, um, from 6.30 to 7.30 at the ESDC. It is family, food, and fitness, tips for healthy choices in our busy, busy lives. And we will be live streaming that over Facebook, so if you can't make it there in person, please join us online. And then um, on March 27th, the topic will be today's drug trends. Both will have free childcare for um, children three and older, and both will be presented in both English and Spanish. The CFB Council PTA would also like to thank our trustees um, for your dedication to our students and our children in our district. January, as we said, is School Board Appreciation Month, and we're very grateful for your time, your dedication, and the service that you provide our community and the students that you serve. Your actions and decisions affect the present and future lives of all of our students. As always, the CFB Council PTA Board thanks you for your continued support of PTA. Thank you. I would now like to invite up Reverend R Willie Rainwater and his lovely wife, um, Juanita, because um, we would like to do a special proclamation for them as they celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Carrollton MLK Parade. I would like to invite up um, State Representative Julie Johnson to do the proclamation. Thank you so much for having me. Having just been sworn in, this is my first resolution as your new state representative, and it's quite an honor to be here. <laughs> you know, Martin Luther King was one of the great Americans of our country, fighting racial injustice, seeking out equality for all people, and shining a light on hatred and division and exposing that for what it is and leading our country to a better place. While he was doing that on a national scene, Willie Rainwater was doing that here on a local scene. Attending high school in a segregated time, being a leader here in Carrollton, Farmers Branch area, shining the light, fighting the prejudice, and leading us in this community to a far better place. For your Un your tireless years of service, it is my absolute honor to be here to offer this resolution of the state of Texas in your honor. Whereas citizens of Carrollton are coming together on January 19th, 2019 for the city's annual celebration of the life of the great civil rights leader and humanitarian Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And whereas founded and organized by the Reverend Willie Wainwater, the Martin Luther King Jr. Parade in Carrollton is sponsored by Christ Community Connection, a nonprofit dedication to providing educational scholarships to Carrollton Farmers Branch Independent School District students in need. And whereas Dr. King rose to national prominence in 1955 through 1956 when he served as a leader of the historic bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, 
The effort led to a national banning of segregation in local and interstate travel and helped to launch the civil rights movement. And whereas in 1957, Dr. King and a number of other ministers founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an influential civil rights organization that coordinated mass protest campaigns and voter registration drives across the South. He served as president of the SL, um, SCLC from its inception until his death on April 4th, 1968. And whereas during the tumultuous 1960s, Dr. King stood at the forefront of nonviolent movement demanding racial equality and social economic justice, he traveled more than six million miles and spoke at over 2,500 events, including the 1963 March on Washington, where he delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. He was integral in the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and he was a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. And whereas celebrations of Dr. King's life and work provide a welcome opportunity to honor his immeasurable courage and legacy and to reaffirm our commitment to the ideals he fought so valiantly to advance and now therefore be it resolved that the 2019 Carrollton MLK Parade be commemorated and that all those in attendance be extended sincere best wishes for a meaning and memorial event signed by the state of Texas, your state representative. It's an honor to present this to you, sir. You are an example of the kind of citizen we all need to be. Thank you so very much. That concludes my announcements. Oh, That's it. <laughs> All right, at this time, we're going to recognize our employees of the nine weeks. We have two employees this nine weeks, the second nine weeks. One's a professional and one's a paraprofessional. We want to honor those individuals who work so hard each and every day that are an integral part of the education of our children. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, members of the board, special guests, which includes the Blaylack Choir, also known as Future Mustangs. My name is uh, Joe LaPuma, and I have the honor to be the principal at Creekview High School. I'm also honored tonight to be able to introduce and recognize Mrs. Teal Perez as CFB's and Creekview's professional of the nine weeks. Mrs. Perez serves the students and staff at Creekview as our lead counselor. Teal has been in the district for over 14 years, serving first at Perry, where as the principal at that time, I had the honor to hire her. That was a good move. <laughs> in her first year at Creekview, which is now, in her new role as a lead counselor, Mrs. Perez continues to shine. She is a worker. One that is always positive and always puts what is best for students at the top of her list. Her experience most recently as, a, as the Blaylack counselor and um, as an avid coordinator has helped her prepare her move, prepare her for her move to Creekview where she has hit the ground running in her lead counseling position. She's positive, dependable, and a get her done kind of person and is always looking for ways to improve what is best for our students. I will admit there were a couple of days during the first nine weeks that Mr. Perez just stopped and looked at me and said, oh my gosh, Joe, we're so busy. <laughs> and I would just say, yes, we are. But on, another, on a personal family note, and I have permission to share this, her father was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And so we were busy, but she was also busy dealing with her father, who eventually passed away January the 1st. But to Teal's credit, she didn't miss a beat. Between hospital visits, 
taking care of her family. Luke and that little guy, Owen, that we saw, she just does her job and did it very well, no matter the circumstances. So Mrs. Perez is an amazing person and an amazing professional that can balance life, family, and work at levels to con that continues to impress me and her colleagues. So we're thankful, very, very thankful to have Teal again as part of our team and honored to be able to recognize her tonight as Creekview's and CFB's professional of the nine weeks. I'm Tracy Smith, Assistant Superintendent of Elementary School, and I'm so pleased to be here tonight to introduce you to Erica Guerrero, my wonderful secretary. Erica is a wonderful member of the educational services team and vital to everything that goes on. It's amazing, but as I started to think about Erica, I found that the letters of her name describe her perfectly. E stands for efficient. If you're ever throwing a party for thousands of people, Erica is your girl. She's instrumental each year in making the vision of Learn More, Achieve More and the Elementary Olympiad possible. In addition, she coordinates professional development for elementary staff throughout the district. R represents her, uh, her ability to create and nurture relationships. She embodies the I care philosophy and works well with those who call with kudos or concerns. I is for indispensable. I'm known to come up with crazy ideas at the last minute that I wanted implemented yesterday. She never says she can't do something, even when her plate is full. C is for calm. Mom of four, Ruben Jr., sophomore at Early College High School, Mia, seventh grade at Vivian Field, Julian and Josue, two of the cutest twins you'll ever meet, who were in our two-year-old class at the Child Development Academy. And I believe mo uh, many of our family members are here tonight, so thank you for coming. Teens and toddlers. We have a new TV show that Erica can star in. <laughs> Kay has to stand for kind. I have never heard her utter an unkind word in the six years we've worked together. And A must stand for appreciated. The majority of people in this audience tonight and others around the district have been positively affected by the great work you do. Erica, for that, and all that you do for each teacher and principal in this district, we appreciate you. You are truly another A word, amazing. Good evening, Dr. Chapman and board members. I am Aviance Jones, principal of Las Colinas Elementary IB World School, and I am proud to introduce to you our teacher of the second nine weeks, Ms. Lindsay Ellison. This is Ms. Ellison's fifth year at Las Colinas, but her 12th year in education. 
Ms. Ellison is a product of CFB, attending Blaylack Middle School and graduating from Newman Smith High School. So she knows the power of continuous improvement. Not only does Ms. Ellison get her students excited about learning, but she is also excited about learning. Well, she's excited about everything. <laughs> From the light bulb moment of when her students get it, to her PD time with our LA coach, to teaching another teacher about how to incorporate technology into her classroom, and boy does she know technology, she is excited. I am convinced there isn't a brighter smile or a person perkier than Miss Ellison. She is truly a ray of sunshine throughout the halls of Las Colinas except her rays are hot pink sprinkled in glitter. <laughs> we are so blessed that she is part of the Las Colinas staff. Congratulations, Ms. Ellison. We love you. Good evening, my name is Dawn Rink and I'm the proud principal of McCoy Elementary. This evening we are here tonight to introduce to you our teacher of the second nine weeks, Miss Katie Cannon. Ms. Cannon <clears throat> started her CFB journey as a Las Colinas Mustang in 2003. In the summer of 2015, Katie took a leap from Las Colinas because of all that great IB stuff, you know, to McCoy Elementary and taught fourth grade leap and has been at Ms. McCoy ever since. In November, Ms. Cannon celebrated her 15 years of teaching at the CFB Service Award Ceremony. There are many reasons why our team has selected Ms. Cannon for this rec recognition, but of course, a student can say it better than anyone else in the best offbeat Miss Cannon kind of way. Dear Miss Cannon, the support you have given me is incredible. My favorite part of your class is when you said that we needed to know the area of the triangle. Because if Soham's boss told him to find the area of a triangular building, he wouldn't because he couldn't and then he would be fired just for you. Our McCoy Elementary team is indeed fortunate and so blessed to recognize Miss Katie Cannon as our teacher of the second nine weeks. All right, good evening, Dr. Chapman and members of the board. My name is Matt Pruitt, and I have the privilege of serving as the proud principal of McCamey Elementary School. Tonight, we honor Lonnie Bolden as McCamey Elementary School's teacher of the second nine weeks. <laughs> he is joined tonight by his mom, his sister, nephew, right here, little brother and girlfriend. <laughs> This is Lundy's first year teaching. He is a CFB product. He attended Montgomery Blair Elementary School, Vivian Field Middle School, and R.L. Turner High School. <laughs> Lundy was a student coordinator for Casey's Run and also voted as a top 10 student by his teachers. He is also one of our campus coordinators for Casey's Run. Lundy has a positive and infectious personality. He is kind, he's patient, and he's a great role model for our students. Lonnie can often be seen greeting his students at the door with a cool handshake or greeting each day. Yes, 31 different greetings to be exact. One of his coworkers said, Lonnie is often seen interacting with his students even when they are not making the best choices. <laughs> 
He encourages and builds them up even when they're having a hard time. Congratulations, Lonnie. You truly show what it means to teach with hard work. We appreciate you for choosing CFB and McKamey. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, members of the board. My name is Dee Dee Lacey, and I am honored to serve as the principal at McLaughlin Strickland Spark STEM Academy. Today we have our bilingual fifth grade teacher, Miguel Castillo, to receive the Teacher of the Month. Miguel started his career in CFB at McLaughlin Strickland as a third grade student teacher, followed by a long-term subposition in fifth grade that in 2014. As we saw Miguel in action, we knew we needed that charm and tenacity full-time at McStrick. The following year, we hired him as a first grade teacher. He set the bar high for all his students, and they all meet those expectations. Students and parents alike love Mr. Castillo. Each year they beg him, can we please have him again, please? <laughs> After two years in first grade, we looped him up to, with one lucky second grade class to second. And there he exceeded uh, the expectations with more than half his class uh, meeting that end of year reading level by uh, exceeding it by two and three levels. After two years of teaching second, he expressed an interest in possible administration, which we still haven't lured him into that quite yet. So I remember sitting down and thinking, talking to him about his fear. I said, you know, you really need to try a star grade. So he took on that leap of faith again, and now he's teaching fifth grade bilingual and attending SMU for his master's. Um, his former students in second grade say that a special, he is a special person that was always there for hard times, a good listener. He had fun activities and always cheered them up. Miguel is all about students. He has coached the bilingual meet and the uh, Olympiad. He's coached soccer for boys and girls. He's also dressed up as Mac the Tiger for arrival. And at dismissal, he is the traffic master with one of his former teammates as he gets that crazy traffic into orderly flow. He's always willing to help and learn and of course to teach the students to their highest potential. He is a wonderful role model and as one student put it, to wrap it up, I might not be the best student every teacher wants to have, but you sure are the teacher every student wants to have. So that is why you're the teacher of the nine weeks. Good evening, Dr. Chapman and our esteemed board members. My name is Eddie Reed, and I am the proud principal, as you can tell by my PTA numbers, of Catherine S. McWhorter Elementary. It is truly my honor tonight to introduce McWhorter's teacher of the second nine weeks, Miss Sandy Myers. Ms. Myers is a product of CFB and has been part of the McOrder family for seven years and is currently serving as our reading recovery teacher. You know, it takes a special kind of skill set to teach students in first grade how to read when they struggle. However, it takes magic to make them successful and develop a love for reading. Sandy Myers, without a doubt, has that magic. The magic Sandy possesses is that she can take a non-reader and give them the strategies and the skill sets to, set, to get them reading fluently, but she also instills in them 
the confidence and a love for reading that creates in them the desire to become lifelong readers. And her magic just isn't for children. She shares the magic with her peers and her parents as well. You can always find her teaching teachers and parents how to make ch uh, their children better readers. And I believe when we look at teachers who make a difference in the lives of children they touch, they always possess something. And I believe for Sandy, it's the magic she shares with her students and that she creates in them the ability to make magic themselves, the ability to read. We are proud and blessed and grateful to have Sandy Myers as part of the Coyote family. Good evening, Dr. Chadman, members of the board and esteemed guests. My name is Charlotte Thomas, and I'm the principal of Annie Hetz Rainwater Elementary. And I am pleased um, tonight to introduce our teacher of the nine weeks, Mrs. Catherine Moreno. <laughs> Kathy is a product of CFB, having attended Montgomery Elementary. Vivian Fields and graduating from R.L. Turner. After teaching nine years in Little M, Miss Marino joined the Rainwater family where she has been making the difference in the lives of our children. In her four-year tenure, Kathy has been the first grade team lead, the third grade team lead, as well as the member of our instructional rounds team. She has been on the student council as the sponsor for four years, as well as sponsoring the safety patrol, green team, and assisting the newspaper club. Additionally, Ms. Marino is our Vice President of our PTA for Hospitalities. We are fortunate to have Mrs. Kathy Marino as part of our school, and we are proud to name her our Teacher of the Nine Weeks. Good evening, Dr. Chapman and board trustees. My name is Pam Henderson, and I'm the proud principal of Spark STEM Academy at River Chase Elementary. It is my privilege to introduce you to our teacher of the second nine weeks, Janine Gay. <laughs> Janine is a proud graduate of CFB schools. She attended Rosemead, Blaylack, and Newman Smith High School. She has been a teacher in CFB for 15 years, 10 at Janie Stark, and the last five at River Chase. Janine is a champion for all students, but she is especially passionate about working with our students who have various learning disabilities. Over the years, she has taught students in the Content Mastery Resource class, PPCD Kindergarten, and Support Center. She serves as our campus coordinator for Casey's Run, works on various campus committees, and she has volunteered to organize after-school car rider dismissal for the entire school year. Janine exemplifies the attributes of a River Chase Eagle in all that she does. One of her students' parents said, Mrs. Gay has been supportive since day one. I am grateful because her heart has never changed. We feel the same way, Janine, and we are proud to honor you as our teacher of the second nine weeks. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, and members of the board. I am Laura Gutierrez, the principal at Rosemead Elementary. This evening, it is my pleasure to recognize our teacher of the second nine weeks, 
recipient, Coach Tom Castillo. Coach Castillo helps motivate and encourage students to live a healthy lifestyle each day as our PE coach. Coach has been in education for 20, 32 years, 25 of those years have been in CFB, and seven, he's been a Rosemead Roadrunner. Through Coach Castillo's guidance, Rosemead students have top fitness gram scores. He has been awarded three different grants over the years and is passionate about supporting Casey's run. Fifth grader Adriana states, He's push he pushes us to be the best we can. When I started here, I didn't believe I was an athlete, but he's told me I am a good athlete, so I believe it. <laughs> a coworker stated, Tom is an absolute professional each day and a quality role model for our young students. His fun and content-centered lessons cause students to be excited for class every day. Thank you, Coach Castillo, for everything you do and incorporating our writing and everything that we're trying to get our campus to do. Um, he just jumps right on board. So congratulations on this well-deserved honor. We are blessed to have you as a part of our Rosemead family. Good evening, I'm Amy Miller, principal of Sheffield Elementary, and it is my joy to introduce to you Sheffield's teacher of the second nine weeks, Courtney Wilson. <laughs> Courtney serves as the intermediate PASS teacher. PASS stands for Positive Attitudes for Success, and Courtney is responsible for helping students with behavior differences learn skills to be successful in the general ed setting. And she makes great strides every day. Courtney has taught in several areas of special education and in several various schools here in CFB, but how fortunate are we that she is now serving at Sheffield. Courtney seeks to have a relationship with each child helping each child make progress toward IEP goals so that he or she feels successful. Mrs. Wilson's students had this to say, she is always nice and positive. She shows us respect. She helps me do my work and she tells us to go to the calm down area when I am feeling angry. <laughs> then I feel better. Courtney truly knows the heart of children and how to help them grow emotionally as well as academically. Courtney's laugh is contagious and her outlook positive. She sees the potential in each child and colleague and I am so blessed to call her friend, colleague and mentor. I learn from her daily, just, it's just an awesome thing. We are indeed blessed in CFB and Sheffield to have Courtney Wilson as the teacher of the second nine weeks. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, and members of the board. My name is Shannon Brown, and I am the proud principal of the Janie Stark Stallions. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our teacher of the nine weeks, Miss Natalie Stout. <laughs> Miss Stout teaches our second grade mathematicians and scientists. She has been in CFB for four years and education for five. Ms. Stout's journey to education started with a fashion design degree, and you can see that play out in her bold, custom-styled, student-centered classroom. <laughs> also your outfit, yes. That's, that's at the end, that's at the end. 
Whether she is creating uh, differentiated critical thinking activities or teaching restorative discipline techniques, Ms. Stout will use the latest research-based trends to go the extra mile for all her students. As the co-director of ATB, she continues to utilize her warm, colorful personality to cultivate positive relationships with all of the Janie Stark students and families. We are honored to have the stylish Miss Natalie Stout as our teacher of the second nine weeks. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, members of the board. My name is Robert Atchison, and I am the proud principal of Thompson Elementary. It's my pleasure tonight to recognize Mrs. Reina Renteria as Thompson Elementary's teacher of the second nine weeks. <laughs> Mrs. Renteria is a teacher at Thompson Elementary. She is a fourth grade bilingual teacher in her third year of teaching. She has stated that she went into teaching to be the very teacher that she wishes she always had. She was born in Mexico and, and came to the States and was educated with teachers that didn't necessarily speak her language. And so she's able to be that for her students each and every day. She leads them in tirelessly in what she does each day with technology, a self-contained fourth grade bilingual teacher. And if you guys know what fourth grade is, that's a lot of work. And so we are so, so very pleased that you choose to come each and every day to Thompson Elementary and you make it your home for our students. And thank you so much for being our teacher of the second nine weeks. That was pretty special, starting with the beautiful music, and then we got to hear the proclamation about the MLK Parade, which if anybody feels like it's too hot outside, wait till Saturday, I hear. <laughs> and um, since y'all have Monday off, please come to the MLK Parade on Saturday at 10 a.m. We'd love to have y'all there, and um, I think it's a real special thing that it's been something the Rainwires have been promoting for 25 years. We were fortunate to have Mayor Die, if he, I think he, might not still be here, and also um, Representative Julie Johnson. So we, we appreciate all that. I'd like to thank Candace Valenzuela as part of School Board Appreciation Month for being here since she had a baby on December 26th. So um, she summonsed herself and she wasn't gonna miss any meetings. So we appreciate her diligence and the rest of the board members. Um, we do this for the same reason y'all do what you do. We care about the kids. So. Um, I'd like to thank all the campuses that brought and presented your teachers and your staff members to us. We can't help but be excited about the people that we have working with the kids and how we really want to do everything we can to make the kids as successful in the rest of their lives as possible. Um, board members, does anybody have anything to say? Uh, and also thank you for the wonderful basket of gifts. And um, really we do this because we here. So, um, anything else? Oh, and Ms. Valenzuela, tell us about your son. Uh, he, his name is Henry Jacinto Baldwin, and he was nine pounds, 14 ounces. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody warned me. <laughs> you told me you thought he might be nine. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, he might be a nine pound baby was what I thought, and it was not the case. Uh, <laughs> in fact, the delivery nurses looked at me and said, you just gave birth to a toddler. Congratulations. 
Um, and, and actually, on a related note, I would really like to thank uh, Dr. Chapman and the staff here for making it as hospitable as possible uh, for me to have little Henry with me. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, we, we, all, we now have changing tables in both uh, the men's and women's rooms. Um, I have a nice little chair right back there. And it's, it's meant a lot to me to be able to uh, still be a part of my family and be a part of CFB's family as well. Thank you. So with that, thank you to our, all of our people we recognized and thank you to all the attendees. I like the shirts, I like the pom-poms, <laughs> I like the lights. <laughs> Um, I like the parents. Okay, so would the mother of the young man that was embarrassed that his mother was going to make a scene, is, is she still here? Oh, okay. Oh, good. Well, I was going to try to embarrass you. But, um, <laughs> but we appreciate all y'all coming here to help them feel appreciated. So thank you. And with that, um, it is 8.03 p.m. and we'll take a 10-minute recess and we'll be back at 8. 13 p.m. The Carrollton Farms Branch ISD Board of Trustees is called back to order at 8.13 p.m. The next item on the agenda is audience for guests. Ms. Cassinon, are there any audience for guests this evening? Oh, well, I know, but <coughs> is our audience for guests here? I don't think he is. Um, our audience for guests was Reverend Willie Wainrotter, and I think I think he may have left. So um, I think unless anybody knows if he's planning on coming back, that's the only one that we had. So I think he probably wanted to talk about MLK weekend and the parade, but I think we probably covered his areas he was going to cover, we hope. So, yeah, I can't say it real fast. Neither could Re Representative Johnson. <clears throat> so there, are, since there appears to not be our speaker that signed up tonight. We'll proceed to our next agenda item, number four, consent agenda. agenda. The consent agenda is a mechanism that the board uses to approve a number of routine items together with a single vote. In compliance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, the public notice for this meeting includes the list of all consent agenda items, and the board has been provided ample information about these items in advance. Prior to any action taken on the consent agenda, board members may request withdrawal of individual items for clarification or discussion. Board members, are there any items to be removed from the consent agenda at this time? If there are no items to be removed, do I have a motion regarding the consent agenda? Mr. Shackman. Ms. Klein, I would make a motion that we approve the consent agenda as it has been presented. I have a motion by Mr. Shackman. I have a second by Mr. Ramos. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Um, that is unanimous, so seven, four, and zero against. Um, item number five, non-action items for discussion and consideration. The next item is 5A, discussion of dual language program. Dr. Warnock, Dr. Chapman. Yeah, at this time, uh, Dr. Nor Warnock's going to walk through the process that we took to uh, review and advise our dual language program. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Uh, Ms. Klein, members of the board, uh, it is our pleasure to present recommendations from a dual language task force that we will begin to implement in 2019-20. We have a proud and rich history of dual language instruction in Carrollton Farmers Branch. We've had our current dual language model in place for 11 years and have been studying the effects of this model for the past five years. Over the past five years, we've assembled two task forces to review data, to study best practices, and to determine what our needs are as we move forward. While we have had success for our students, we want to continue to become even better. We assembled a team who cares fiercely about all children in CFB and are passionate about the best outcomes for students so that they graduate from CFB ready to compete in a global economy. Language is culture and we want to acknowledge the deep-seated feelings that many have when we discuss how to best meet the needs of our bilingual learners. 
We celebrate the diversity of our community and we want to continue with an additive model of literacy and language. I want to acknowledge that while the model we select is incredibly important, the most important fact to, factor to a student's learning is the teacher in the classroom in front of the child and the principal of the building who provides the leadership to that, uh, to that school. Long story short, we want to share with you the why and some additional details tonight, but this is what we want you to walk away with. One, we have studied this a lot over time. Two, we need to make improvements to our program. Three, our model will remain very similar to its current state in K2. Four, we will have more transition to English in grades three through five. And this task force that was led by Tracy Smith, our assistant superintendent for elementary school, has worked diligently to arrive at the recommendations that they will share tonight. And I want to thank them for their incredible work, time, and commitment. So Ms. Smith, I turn the presentation to you. force uh, to share the process and the enhancements that were put together by this dedicated group of individuals. This slide shows uh, the members who represent a broad range of interests. The group was comprised of bilingual teachers, ESL teachers who share students with the bilingual counterpart, bilingual instructional coaches and specialists, principals and assistant principals, the directors of all four core content areas, as well as the elementary and secondary directors of bilingual ESL. These members represent each bilingual campus in the district and were chosen for their expertise regarding the research surrounding bilingual English language acquisition, their passion for providing an equitable education for all students, and their pedagogical expertise. This group was tasked with providing a recommendation to the superintendent for revisions to the district's dual language program. Tonight, we have several members of the task force in the audience. Would you please stand and be recognized for your hard work and diligence? <laughs> Thank you. In addition, several members of the task force will uh, present in our meeting tonight. Carolina Christensen, Director of Elementary, Bilingual, and ESL. Evangelia, El, excuse me, Evangelina Rios, Classroom Teacher from Blanton Elementary. Arelis Reyes, Elementary Bilingual Instructional Coach. Susan Machayo, Principal of Farmers Branch Elementary. And Susan Kelly, Director of Elementary Language Arts. And they're here tonight to share with you the changes to our dual language program. If you ask 10 people their thoughts regarding bilingual education, chances are that you will get 10 different answers. With such, so much debate, why do we even offer a dual language program? The answer is clear. First is mandated by law. Texas Education Code 89.1205 delineates Oh gosh, I knew I was going to stumble there. The lineates that a dual language program shall be provided in pre-kindergarten through the remainder of the elementary years. Through one of the four program models shown on the screen. More importantly, however, CFB truly believes that biliteracy and bilingualism are benefits to students' current and future academic and social success. Currently, CFB offers a dual language immersion one-way program at 11 campuses and a dual immersion two-way program in three campuses. To ensure that the task force had a common basis for discussion of this important topic, portions of each meeting were spent studying, discussing, and debating current research on dual language education. The research listed on the screen are a few of the pieces that were considered. Those in red serve as the primary texts as they contain the most recent thoughts on dual language education. This research was utilized to frame a vision statement for the work that was before us. In a final version, it reads, 
The vision of Carrollton Farmers Branch ISD's dual language program is to develop students who possess strong bilingual, biliterate, academic, and cross-cultural competencies that enable them to contribute effectively to the global society. Once the vision was determined, the task force analyzed district data and examined the current program's strengths and limitations. While the task force made changes to the one-way and two-way programs, the majority of time was focused on the one-way program as the majority of our campuses operate under this model. After the one-way program was developed, a group who was knowledgeable regarding the two-way program met to determine if the changes would work for this program as well. It was determined that the needs are common for both programs except in fifth grade. We'll show you where these recommendations differ a bit later in the presentation. While the strengths of our program are numerous, the group honed in on these three concerns as the basis for programmatic changes. The rationale for these revisions will be discussed as we look at the proposed schedule for each grade level. But first, let's take a brief look at the current model. CFB's dual language model was revised five years ago based on the research and feedback that was available. To improve student achievement, the committee met, revised the schedule to enable one teacher to focus primarily on language arts and Spanish and the partner teacher to focus on mathematics and ESL transitional skills in English. In addition, an ESL time was added to the schedule and curriculum was developed to give students exposure to vocabulary and comprehension skills in English. It was felt that this would, be better enable, this would better enable students to transfer their literacy skills from Spanish to English. During the five years that this revision has been in place, we have seen improvement in student learning, but not enough. This was the impetus for our task force to once again look at data and review feedback from parents and staff. Parents expressed concern that their students were learning Spanish well, but their English was not strong enough. In addition, STAR scores show that some of our sixth graders are experiencing difficulty as they transfer transition from elementary where they can test in either English or Spanish to the middle school where all assessments must be taken in English. As our district goal is high achievement for each student, it was imperative that our task force propose revisions to further accelerate student learning. The information provided next are the recommendations that evolve from our work. Analysis of the current program for primary grades focused around two issues. The first is a concern that teachers brought up regarding basic math, vocabulary, and Spanish. Staff reports that as students write in Spanish, they revert to English for numbers, shapes, and other mathematical terms due to the fact that these words are never directly taught in Spanish. For this reason, in our new model, calendar math has been shifted to the Spanish teacher grades K2. This vocabulary will also be taught in English during the regular math instruction. Materials or translations of current materials, as long as with training, will be needed to effectively implement this recommendation. The biggest concern the group addressed focused around the ESL component. While an ESL curriculum is currently in place, teachers do not feel that it is effective and is providing students with the skills to unlock the intricacies of the English language. In addition, progress in the ESL component is not documented on the report card. To address these concerns, the task force recommended shifting from the current ESL program to a language development program that will focus on reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Grades will be taken and progress will be reported to the parents via the traditional report card. This should directly assist students as they prepare for Texas English Language Proficiency Assessment System exams telpass. Current research shows that several components are necessary for students to successfully transition from Spanish to English. This slide shows those components that will be implemented as part of the language development program. District staff members are currently examining materials to identify a program or pieces of a program that can be utilized to provide the curriculum to our staff. The language development component will contain engaging, interactive lessons and allow students to practice their reading, writing, listening, and speaking skills. District and title, and title funds, along with the instructional materials allotments, will be utilized to purchase these materials. Trainings will be, will be provided for K-2 teachers during their implementation year, and district instructional coaches will be available to help support the launch as well. 
Second grade is very similar to, to the kindergarten and first grade program. The only difference comes with the time allotments. For kindergarten and first grade, social studies and science is allotted 40 minutes with language development comprising 50 minutes. <coughs> this flip-flops in second grade as students will have gained the skills necessary to begin reading more independently in the content areas. Third grade is a transitional grade. Not only is it the first time students are tested with STAR, it is also a time where students are more independent. In our current model, the Spanish teacher only teaches in Spanish. You'll notice that there is now a time frame where the Spanish teacher will teach word study in English. This will be a purposeful time where teachers will bridge two languages, pointing out the similarities and differences between the two. Science and social studies are now separate, and time increases to enable students to go into greater depth with their academic content. At third grade, calendar math is moved back into the mathematic block as students should have a firm grasp of mathematical vocabulary in English and Spanish by this time. Star testing decisions at all grades are determined for each student on an individual basis by the campus LPAC committee. However, as is currently the standard, for the most part, STAR testing and reading will be in Spanish, and students will test in English for mathematics. The language portion of the day will introduce some new components in third grade. Items such as book clubs, Socratic seminars, and debate will be included the first time, as the skills learned in the primary grades can be used to a greater extent. As with primary, grades will be given and progress will be shared with parents via a report card. Earlier in the presentation, we discussed three main concerns that were to be addressed through program modifications. The first was the ESL component, and the second was mathematic vocabulary in the primary grades. The final concern was around the STAR assessment only being administered in English beginning in sixth grade. Formal and informal data indicates that some of our students have difficulty transitioning to testing in English due to the fact that they are not given enough time in the elementary years to engage with complex English text. To address this issue, the committee, after long research and debate, finally came to the conclusion that the language enrichment time needed to move to being taught by the Spanish teacher, beginning in fourth grade. The focus of the English language enrichment will be vocabulary and comprehension, with students participating in fiction and nonfiction book clubs. Putting all language arts instruction with one teacher will enable staff to monitor the transference of comprehension skills from one language to another as they possess the most integrate knowledge of the language arts curriculum. In accordance with the definitions provided by the state of Texas in their four program models, these changes mean that CFB will no longer utilize the one-way dual language immersion model. Instead, the district will be considered a late exit program meaning that we will not provide 50% of our language instruction in English and 50% in Spanish. It is our hope that with the modifications presented in grades K through third, our students will gain the skills necessary to enable us to revisit this decision in the future. STAR testing in fourth grade will remain unchanged. For the most part, students will test in Spanish for reading and writing in English for mathematics as that is the language of instruction. The biggest change to the dual language program comes during the fifth grade year where almost all of a student's day will now be in English. While in fourth grade students reading capabilities are the focus for English instruction, writing is added to the fifth grade one-way program. This will ensure that students can adequately convey their thoughts and feelings in an English-only environment in sixth grade. 
You'll also notice that the language enrichment time changes from a focus on English to a focus on Spanish. It was important to the task force that students continue to receive direct instruction in Spanish. Even with the additional time in English, students will remain with a bilingual teacher who demonstrates a strong command of both languages. This will be important so they can quickly identify students who may experience difficulties and quickly provide a translation or support to get them back on track. While it appears social studies time is reduced, this is actually not the case, as almost half of the reading and writing units are based upon social studies content. Students will take their reading star test in their preferred language, while mathematics testing, for the most part, will remain in English. For two-way dual students, star testing has always been in their dominant language. Because of this, fewer modifications need to be made to their fifth grade program. While this model is still considered late exit, students will continue to build reading and writing skills in both languages. This will be important as they continue their studies in both languages during their middle school experience. As you saw throughout our presentation, in order to prepare for implementation of the enhanced dual language program, the district will need to develop curriculum, procure and or translate materials, and provide professional development and ongoing support for implementation. For these reasons, it is not feasible to implement the new program in all grade levels in 2019-2020. Based on the data and feedback used by the task force for program development, the group recommends that the program be implemented over a two-year period. Kindergarten, fourth and fifth grades will begin during the 2019-2020 school year with all other grade levels coming online during 2020-2021. Pardon me. Our next steps are to communicate the changes that we've shared with you tonight the task force will once again meet on February 7th to plan two presentations that will be held at each dual language campus. The first meeting will be designed for campus staff in order to prepare them for the future of the program. The second meeting will be held with parents. In order to maximize our audience, principals will hold dual language pre uh, presentations in conjunction with another meeting that is designed to draw a big audience. We ask principals to have the meeting with staff in February and with parents before the end of April. It's imperative that our bilingual program prepare our students with the reading, writing, listening, and speaking skills in both languages to help them be truly bilingual and biliterate. It is our belief that these changes will help us accomplish this vision and further the district goal of high achievement for each student. This concludes our report. Dr. Chapman, at this time, we're happy to answer any questions. Board members, are there any questions? I think Sally has some. I first want to thank the committee for all their hard work. I am a parent of two dual children who've been in the program since 2008, so we are long invested in the dual language program. And I know that this is hard, tedious work, and I appreciate the efforts in looking to make sure we're doing the right thing because just because we've always done it one way doesn't mean that it's the right way to do it and i think it's we should be reevaluating um, our methods i think the identification of the um, concerns is valid from just a parent standpoint so i'm glad to hear that that was identified by the staff as well and i think the changes that are recommended make sense as a parent um, so i hope that that's something that um, the community and the parents that are in these programs will understand. Uh, I do have a few questions. Uh, do we, I know this was going to be presented to the middle school staff, principals. Um, I, I'm just curious how that went and do they agree? Because that's obviously where we're trying to impact the most is those sixth graders. So do those principals feel like this is the right model to get us where we need to be? There was unanimous uh, approval from our secondary team, uh, both our middle school and high school principals. I see some head nodding in the back um, from some of them that are, are sitting there. Um, yeah, wide, wide support um, for the changes that were uh, made today. We walked through the program uh, with all of our principals, both elementary and secondary today. So our secondary team is fully on board with the recommendation. 
that's great to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay, and my other question was, I know we talked about, y'all presented that you're going to do a parent meeting. Is there something more that we could put in writing to send out to these parents um, sooner than later, just because I'm sure word's gonna spread that there's changes, and, and I know the word that I said was, a lot of times when parents choose a program like this, especially from the English side, um, it's a conscious choice that the family makes. They're, they're going in and choosing, purchasing the education for their child is kind of how you look at it. And to have such a drastic change made in some of the grade levels um, can feel very much like there was a change to what they were originally sold. Um, so I think the quicker we can notify the parents so that we can get ahead of that, the better. I think it's a great plan. I don't think there should be a lot of opposition to the plan, but as a parent, I would want to know sooner than later that something's coming down the pipe. That's great yeah. feedback, and we will get something in uh, writing out to our parents very soon. Thank you all for your hard work on this. Thank you, Ms. Derrick. Are there any other questions? I really don't have any questions, I just have comments. I want to thank everybody that's on that committee. I know you guys have the children's um, best interest at heart when you were moving forward with the decision, and it is kind of a radical change in some of the grades, but if you really feel this is what's best for the children in our district, um, I want to thank you for doing that and bringing us that information. Mr. Shackman? Uh, it, it would be helpful, I think, for us as board if uh, and you don't have to do it right this second, but perhaps if uh, in the next couple of weeks, if you could get us some information, the number of students on campuses uh, in the one-way and two-way program, so we kind of have a sense of the size and magnitude and scope as we're, we're talking about this and, and remind us again of which campuses are involved. So as we're out and interfacing with parents and we get asked questions about where are the changes, we can plug them in. Absolutely, we will send that to you tomorrow. Um, so that, that's uh, easy for us to do. Uh, we have you know, almost 30% of the children in CFB are language learners. Um, so some of them, you know, we have over 65 languages spoken in our district. The great majority of those students speak Spanish and are in our bilingual program. We also serve students in ESL at every one of our campuses. Um, we'll get that information to you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ramos, did you have anything else? No, no. I saw you wave your hand. I, I didn't know if it was. No, I didn't. I actually, Randy just hit on it right at the very end. I, I would just like to add that there was a lot of painstaking work put into this, and I think that it's very beautifully blended together. Uh, the respect for the integrity of both languages is apparent, uh, and it, it seems to have the child in mind long term. And I, I'm just glad that all of you got together to put so much effort into this, so thank you. Thank you for y'all's presentation and your explanations. Thank you. With that, are you ready for item 5B? Yes, ma'am. At this time, um, Ms. Tillman's gonna walk through the bond planning calendar, the processes that we're taking, um, as we move forward and discuss a little bit on the first series. Thank you. Board members, team members throughout CFB have been working very hard in many div divisions to move the work forward with our recently approved bond package. The district has established a preliminary schedule for planning purposes to begin the work. You all have received that preliminary schedule. The tentative schedule was built based on looking at various data points that we want to review with you. The first data point we looked at was the condition of the campus as indicated by the facility condition index. The score is on a 1 to 100 scale. This score was developed by a third party um, during a facility assessment and they looked at everything in the building from the age of the carpet to the age of the paint, the age of the roof, mechanical engineering, plumbing. They looked at sidewalks, they looked at parking lots, they looked at everything on the campus and they ranked all of our campuses using the same set of criteria. So that was the first item we looked at at determining how we were going to determine who was in which group of issues over the course of the next several years. We then looked at the size, scope, and estimated cost of the project or the project groups because we need to group them thoughtfully in a manner that we can actually manage the work. Um, so we had to look at those items as well. 
Once it was determined that the size, scope, and estimated cost of individual projects, some of the smaller projects, um, we've had many challenges over the last couple of um, the last couple of projects we've done that have been smaller dollar amounts, we've had limited bids on those projects. So in order for us to feel like we can get competitive um, construction management or bids on these projects, we needed to group some of these projects to a number that will attract many vendors to do this work. So then we looked geographically and began grouping dollars and projects together and then also looking at their score as well. Um, and it doesn't, it's not a perfect science, but we tried um, to get the buildings with the most need on the front end of the projects. Um, we also wanted to include at least one high school with significant CTE renovations in the first bond issue, as well as at least one of our two major middle school renovations um, and one elementary. So those things we also looked at to make sure we had a good blend in the first issue of projects in size and scope. Um, we had to also think about the industry and how, how all of this was going to come together in terms of workloads. So we looked at all of these things and built the calendar that you all received. Um, based upon the above criteria, we, we developed um, a schedule to where we could roll out four major projects with the first issue, um, which would include one major high school, the middle school and elementary renovation in our one new campus. We wanted the one new campus also to be in on the front end because that's one of the projects that's going to have a recurring operating cost savings to the district. So we wanted to get that done as soon as possible. It has a, a huge education benefit as well to get those kids under one roof. So that's also included in the first issue. In order to get these projects underway, the dis district issued an RFQ for architectural services. We have received 18 responses on that RFQ. So Mr. Kerbo is now in the process of developing a committee that begin looking through the binders upon binders upon binders of information that he's received from 18 vendors. Um, from, those, from this committee, we will select a pool of architects that will be recommended to the board. Um, and then based upon the experience and expertise of the architects that are selected from this pool, we will then choose the four architects for the first project. It could be, may not be four, but for the four projects. Um, and then once the architects selected, we'll follow a same basic pro a project list for each, for each one of these. And we wanted to just kind of walk through what will happen for each campus before you'll actually see ground moving on these campuses. So the first thing we'll do is hire an architect firm for a specific job. Then we'll review our schedule with the architect, which includes the design timelines, the construction timelines. We'll, we'll review all of those and adjust those um, and get in input from the architectural firm. We'll determine the delivery method for the job, which could be construction manager at risk, which you're very familiar with that we've used quite often. Or we could decide that we're going to do a con competitive sealed proposal. Um, the, the, once that is decided, then the design phase of the project will be established, which could be quite lengthy for some of these major renovations that we're looking at within the first projects. After the design phase ends with the architect, then the bid documents will be prepared and will be released um, based upon all of the work performed with the team. Timelines will be established by Mr. Kerbo, and then we'll award the contract for construction. If it's CMAR, then we have to move to the step to determine the guaranteed maximum price for that project. If it's a CSP, then we'll award um, to the vendor that ranks the highest according to the criteria we establish. So once all of those steps have happened, then construction can begin. So I know it's, you know, you, you're excited and you want to see ground moving, but you can see a lot of things have to happen before you'll actually see any of those things happen. And in addition, before you can see any you know, of these things happen, we actually have to have some funds available to do all these things, to hire the architects. So um, we also have underway right now work with our financial advisors um, for the sale of our first series of bonds to fund these projects. 
Um, each of you have received a calendar at your desk, and this is a calendar that we're following right now so that we will be ready to issue these bonds um, according to this calendar. The step that we will be presenting to you next February is for you all to approve the bond order so that we can sell those bonds. And if we stay on this timeline, then we would have funds available in early April. So those are the items that the board will see next. You'll see the bond order in February. And then as soon as we're able to bring a pool of architects to you all for consideration, right now we're targeting March, but it could go into April due to the number that have actually submitted. And we'll bring that to the board for consideration. Um, if everything just went perfect on all of our timelines, we could possibly see um, first construction happening in October of 2019. That's if we were able to get everything moving um, and very quickly. So that's the timeline right now that we're working with. So we have architect work in going on and we have um, financial advisors working on our bond issue. Those two things have to happen before we can do anything and that's what we're focused on right now. Keeping in mind that the schedule we gave you with the projects that we identified, that is all subject to change. And so none of that has been finalized. That is preliminary. We continue to look at that and make sure that we have um, been thoughtful about how we roll out those projects. So that is just a quick summary of where we're at. We'll continue to update you um, as we move forward. And although you may not see ground moving on these projects, we do have some things happening. So if you've been around the district, um, you have seen some ground moving, um, particularly in Farmers Branch and Irving. We're very excited about those projects. We'll continue to keep you updated on those as well. Thank you. Thank you. And that doesn't require any action, but board members, do you have any questions? I would just say to some of the campuses fixing to go under construction, good luck. So, um, <laughs> just looking at one in particular, but, uh, <laughs> but it's an exciting time and I think that the proof has been in the past that the construction has not interfered with the education experience, okay. but it is kind of like remodeling your bathroom at home. So it can be um, impactful in some ways, but we appreciate the staff that we have. So. Um, so that is that item. Are we done with that one? Yes, ma'am. So we're now we're ready for um, items for discussion and or action. And 6A is items removed from consent, which we had none. So we'll go ahead and go to 6B, which is consider approval of district's comprehensive annual financial report, the CAFR, for the period ending August 31st, 2018. Ms. Tillman again. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, before we get started on this item, um, I would like to thank our staff that has spent so much time and effort on this project. We have Scott Roderick um, as our CFO. We have Vicki Pippen. Vicki, will you stand up, please? I know you're probably on the back row somewhere. There she yes. is. <laughs> She's our Director of Financial Reporting. She worked over the Thanksgiving break because we have to have this thing ready and gone to our auditors. Um, in, in between preparing our financials, you might have saw her at Standard Stadium issuing tickets. She also does that in her spare time. So um, you'll see her out there. We also have Michelle Cease. Um, she's probably also on the back row. She, there she is. Um, she also works diligently to make sure all the numbers are ready, um, and we appreciate all of her work. So this team and all of the financial team that's here um, puts in lots of hours um, to make sure that we are doing the best we can um, in regards to our financial management. So I wanted to thank them, and I also want to thank our three audit committee members because they also have come and spent time with us, and it's not as exciting as what you all see at 7 o'clock, but they were here at 5 o'clock many times um, to go over this information with our auditors, and we appreciate their time as well. I um, want to quickly cover the, the legal requirements related to our audit. Um, in accordance with Section 44.008 of the Texas Education Code, the Board of School Trustees of each public school district shall have its school district physical accounts audited annually at district expense by a certified public accountant. The district's external auditors have completed their financial record review for the fiscal year August 31, 2018. The audit committee of the Board of Trustees met at 5 p.m. today to discuss details 
um, of the financial report with the financial man management team as well as our external auditors. Um, the in independent audit must meet at least the minimum requirements and be in the formal pres prescribed by the State Board of Education, subject to review and comment by the state auditor. The audit shall include an audit of the accuracy of the financial information provided by the district through the PEMS system. Um, a copy of the annual audit report, once approved by the Board of Trustees, um, shall be filed with the Texas Education Agency not later than the 150th day after the end of the fiscal year. We wanted to hit on a few quick highlights um, this year. Um, the district did receive an unmodified opinion with no findings, zero findings, zero comments. Um, there was nothing that was reported to our committee um, this evening, and we're very happy about that. In terms of the financial condition of the district, as of August 31st, 2018, the district continues to maintain a healthy fund balance, giving us the ability to be prepared for upcoming legislative changes if needed, along with other needs such as general cash flow requirements um, and the ability to utilize funds for unforeseen circumstances. Um, be able to maintain um, operations until we receive tax collections and maybe a 90-day federal government shutdown. You just never know what you might need your fund balance for. So um, we're happy that we have, have the funds we have available. Um, the district budget variances in the general fund, debt service fund, and food service fund continue to indicate conservative budgeting practices on behalf of this board that support the goal of operational effect effectiveness and long-term financial stability. Um, once, this, once this is approved, we will load it on our website for the public to see everything that you all have received this evening. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to the Audit Committee um, for any comments that they would like. I, I want to thank the administration and the staff that worked diligently on this. I mean, they worked through the holidays uh, so that we can have this report and we can go over it. Tara, there were some, uh, there was a couple things I know you wanted to bring, uh, bring up and discuss as well. Uh, I just wanted everyone to know that um, that team um, and their work for the year ending in August 2017, they received two awards and one um, certificate of achievement for excellent in financial excellence in financial reporting from the Government fin Finance Officers, Officers Association, and they've received this award for 40 consecutive years. Impressive. And then there's a second one. Uh, the no high standards there. <laughs> the Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting from the Association of School Business Officials International. And again, for the um, year ending in August of 2017, and the team has um, received this award for 41 consecutive years. So um, congratulations. The only thing I've received for over 40 years is a year older. So uh, I think it's, um, it says a lot about the team and your diligence in what you do with our communities, uh, our taxpayers' uh, funds and managing that. So our appreciation. Um, because of your work, I, I have the privilege of standing before the community and saying confidently that we're good stewards of their funds, that we are good stewards of their children's funds, and that we are putting every penny where it needs to go when we can. Uh, and that is no small feat with everything else that you're battling against. So thank you so much for everything you've done to report as accurately as possible and to just take care of all of us. So those are our audit committee members, <laughs> volunteers. So is guess, there a motion? I guess, yes, it's Mr. time for Rowe? that motion. So it's, uh, I'm going to make the motion that we approve the district's comprehensive annual financial report, the CAFR, for the period ending August 31st, 2018. And because that's a committee's motion, there is no second required. Um, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed, zero. So that is unanimous. Um, thank y'all. And thank you. Thank you to you, Ms. Tillman, and your staff for those on the back row and Scott for all that you do. And um, so item 6C, consider approval of one-time supplemental payment for the 2018-2019 spring semester. Ms. Tillman. 
One of the benefits the Dallas County Schools transportation drivers and monitors received while they were employed with Dallas County Schools was a fall and spring attendance incentive. This incentive encouraged drivers and monitors to minimize the number of shifts missed during a semester. The district currently has six driver openings and two monitor openings that must be covered daily by subs, causing a strain on the system when large numbers of drivers and monitors call in sick. Um, we've had this number um, of openings since the beginning of school, so it's gone up and down, but it's hovered around six or seven. Um, in addition to the normal number of openings we generally have, DISD recently raised the hourly rate of pay for all drivers within DISD by $3.37, which put their beginning driver pay rate at $20 per hour. We're currently at $16.75 for new drivers with no experience. They're offering $20. The range in our area is 16 to 18, so we're right in the middle. Um, most are closer to 16 to 16.75. Um, so um, with this happening, um, it really impacted the morale of our drivers, not just CFB drivers, but dri drivers within the area to have, this is a significant pay increase that DISD has offered um, for these folks. Um, they were in a different situation. Um, you saw in the news where they had, you know, they had numerous openings and this was um, somewhat really, they really didn't have any other choice. They had to do something to generate enough drivers to cover their opening. I think they had thousands of kids, you know, that were I late. I think I read 200 openings or something. Mm -hmm. So, um, but this did not help the morale of our drivers and so their, their expectations went up for the district. Um, and they, they were really um, had, had hopes that the district would react to DISD's pay raise. Um, we have, Dr. Coleman and I both have gone out and met with them and explained to them, you know, that we're in a mid-year, we're in our first year operating transportation. We really don't have good data to know how much a year's worth of payroll is going to cost us for transportation. So we, you know, I told them that we would talk with our board and it let, I told them I would let you know what their, what their concerns were um, and, you know, that we wanted them to stay with CFB um, and we would do what we could, um, the very best we could um, to offer any, any changes we could this year, but any pay changes would not come until next year when we look at all of our employees' compensation um, together. So, um, but one of the things they did ask for was us to consider an incentive uh, pay for them for this semester. And we felt like that was reasonable to look at because it benefits both them and us. If we can keep them um, showing up and not utilizing their leave, then that helps us with the number of openings we currently have, potentially keeps them here for the rest of the semester. Um, and then um, we can continue to work with our transportation drivers to find opportunities um, to make some changes there. So we have worked with our attorneys and um, developed a resolution to potentially approve one-time pay for the spring semester, which would begin um, next week. We're not going to go back to the first of the semester since they didn't know about it. Um, and so it would begin on that date moving forward. If they miss no more than two days, more than two days of leave, the maximum a driver would receive is $500. It depends on the, the shift that they're on. So some are on eight hours, some are on six, some are on five. So we would adjust accordingly, but the maximum they would receive is a one-time $500 payment in the month of July um, if they missed um, no more than two shifts. And then monitors would receive $375 if they're on an eight hour schedule. Um, we're asking that the board consider approval of the resolution for this one-time supplemental payment for our drivers and monitors as presented. The cost to this, when we looked at records from Dallas County Schools, generally 60 to 65% of the drivers earned this um, incentive every semester. And so utilizing that number, um, we would be around $40,000 um, if we hit 65% uh, of our, our employees eligible. You've received a resolution in advance, but I also put another one on your desk. Um, there are some exceptions that you will see in the criteria, but we're asking board consideration of this resolution. Board members, any discussion? Mr. Matthews? Yes, but I, um, 
because I personally feel that our bus drivers uh, are vital cogs in this machine we have. And I think we should do everything we can to um, satisfy what they need and want. So therefore, I uh, make a motion that we do approve this one-time supplemental payment for the 2018-2019 spring semester. We have a motion by Mr. Matthews. Mm -hmm. Second by Ms. Derrick. Um, any other discussion, Mr. Shackman? Uh, I'm inclined to support that motion. This is an important component. Uh, we know approximately 40,000. Do we know where are we going to find the 40,000? What kind of budget amendment are we looking at? And, and where can we draw this from? We had built contingency funds into the transportation budget. And so at this point, we're within those contingency funds. Um, if the spring semester doesn't trend exactly like we think it is, we could have to come um, to the board um, to amend the budget. But right now, we believe we'll be within the contingencies we currently have. Ms. Tillman, how much do we ever hire bus drivers that aren't CDL drivers yet and train them? We, um, we have a training program, yes, and we also have our on staff um, where we can actually give them the, the test, the CDL test. So, so I think that the ability to not have to train a lot of new people and maybe retain some of our current bus drivers is where we want to be, and I think we kind of all agree that. So with a motion and a second by Ms. Derrick, um, are we ready to have a vote or do we have any more comments? Um, all those in favor? All those opposed? That is seven in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, Ms. Tillman, for your briefing. Um, our next agenda item is item number seven, closed meeting is authorized under Texas government code, including but not limited to section 551.071, consultation with attorney, 551.072, real property, 551.074 personnel matters, 551.076 security devices, 551.082 school children, district employees disciplinary matter or complaint, 551.0821 personally identifiable student information, 551.084 investigation. The specific topics for board deliberation and closed meeting are item 7A, conduct the superintendent summative evaluation. Audience members, we're glad you are here tonight. You're welcome to remain in the boardroom as board members recess and move into room 150, the executive conference room for deliberations. The time is now 9.04 p.m. Having returned from closed session, the time is now 9.34 p.m. We will now address item number 7B, reconvene an open meeting for possible action regarding items discussed in closed meeting. Board members, are there any things to discuss? Mr. Matthews? I'd like to make a motion to approve the supplemental agreement number one to the superintendent term contract between the Board of Trustees of Kelton Farm and Branch Independent School District and Dr. John Chapman. Um, to extend uh, Dr. Chapman's contract to end in 2024. Superintendent's annual salary shall be increased by 3% for the 2019-2020 school year. So we have a motion it, by Mr. Matthews. Mm -hmm. Does that sound complete? Yes, um, do we have a second? Ms. Derrick's first one to second. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposition? So that is unanimous, Ms. Castanon. Um, reports from board members regarding posted agenda items. Board members, any comments? Ms. Castanon, I reported the missing cake. Um, <laughs> adjournment. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of our, yes, Mr. Shackman. I'm not sure the technicalities because it was not an agendized uh, item. I know. Um, I, thought you I, I hope that there is a way that somehow or other as a district we can communicate to campuses, to principals or whatever. You know, we're in the middle of a government shutdown 
And I, I know at least two students, one at high school and one in middle school, whose parent is a, a furloughed government worker right now. And I do not know their situation. I don't know if they live paycheck to paycheck but they would not salary wise have covered and been qualified for free and reduced lunch. And I would hope that somehow or other we might be able through our counselors or whatever to identify and say, listen, we've got your back and we will help with this while this happens. And I don't know the mechanisms, but that's my admonition if, if you all think that's a good idea. Bet a lot you'd... of dear friends that I gained uh, when I worked with TSA that are in, they're in dire straits right now. A lot of those, I mean, I was part-time, uh, but a lot, most of my good buddies in, were full-time and they're, they're hurting. There was a good article in the paper this morning and the, the people that were quoted are really dear friends of mine and it, uh, yeah. Well, it's a bad situation. So we I, need to do everything I just we, would assume that with do. the district our size, as many families as we are involved with, that there are some. And if there is a way that we can assist, I hope we can. Thank you, Mrs. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Shackman. Ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of our agenda and we are adjourned at 9.37 p.m.